Welcome everyone. We are now live from Canada, Amsterdam, and the USA. Hello to all the teachers, students, and everyone else out there watching today. Thank you for joining us today for something very special. My name is Laura, and I'm based in EF's Toronto office. We're joined by our friends and colleagues at the Anne Frank House Museum, who we'll meet in just a moment. You know, I do just want to say right before we get started that while we eagerly wait for the world to open back up to us again one day soon, it's important for us at EF and the Anne Frank House Museum to find meaningful ways to bring the world to you in your classrooms or even at home. And while nothing can compare to standing inside the secret annex where the Frank family hid from Nazi persecution for over two years and reflecting on Anne's story and being in the place where she penned her diary, our friends from the Anne Frank House Museum will transport us there, if only for a moment, and share a glimpse of what that experience is like with you. We hope that it inspires you to learn more about Anne's story and to one day visit the Anne Frank House for yourselves. Now, before we introduce our panelists, let me first share some quick tips about the platform that we're using today. You'll notice that your cameras are automatically turned off and your mics are muted, so you won't be able to turn these functions on for yourselves. You'll notice both a chat and a Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. Please feel free to use the chat box at any time to introduce yourselves, let us know how many of you might be watching together, or just to chat and get to know one another. In fact, why don't we try it out now? In the chat box, let us know where you're watching from today. Okay, we've got Abbotsford, Surrey, Dr. Brusso Middle School, oh, Regina, Halifax, Toronto, oh, wow. Coast to coast, it looks like. <laughs> and at any time, if you have questions for our expert staff from the Anne Frank House Museum, please type them into the Q&A box. And if you have a working microphone, let us know if you'd like to ask your question live. If we get to your question, we'll allow you to unmute yourself so that you can do so. All questions about the Anne Frank House Museum and Anne Frank are welcome. A few of you have submitted your questions in advance, so we'll do our best to get to as many of those as we can. My colleagues Vanessa and Rebecca will be monitoring both the chat and the Q&A for us today. Our tour should last about 40 minutes or so, and we should have 15 to 20 minutes at the end for questions and answers. All right, well, I think that's enough from me. Let's turn it over to our experts from the Anne Frank House Museum. Julie and Morgan, thanks again for being here with us today. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, everyone at the EF tour. Uh, thank you, all of you, for watching. Uh, it's really amazing. I'm really happy to be here with all of you. Um, I'm, I'm the coordinator. My name is Julie Couture. I'm the coordinator of the Canadian project of the Anna Frank House here in Amsterdam. I'm myself a Canadian. You may have heard already. I'm originally from Quebec. I live now for 15 years in the Netherlands and I'm coordinating all our projects that we have in, in Canada, and which means we have three traveling exhibitions that have been so far traveling to different high schools. Mainly, we have been in Quebec, in Ontario, in BC, in Manitoba, and in Alberta. We also have been in Yukon Territory, and we were supposed to go to Nunavut last year, but due to the COVID, it was postponed. So this is a big project is wonderful, but for now it's kind of all on because of the COVID crisis. So that's why we are really happy to be at least now able to welcome you and have this uh, virtual tour together through this digital uh, version. I'm going to co-present this with my colleague Morgan. She's going to present herself in a few moments. So the program is simple. We have a small introduction. Then we're going to go into the virtual uh, tour of the hiding place, the uh, secret annex of the Anna Frank Museum in a way. And then we have time for questions. Uh, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Hopefully it's going to work good. So you should be now seeing PowerPoint and I see my colleague nodding, so I think it's worked. Um, so today it's not, a, uh, this date is not randomly chosen. It's, there's the a real reason why we are doing it today on the 27th of January, because the 27th of January is the date that the United Nations gave itself uh, to 
honor the victim of the Nazi. It's a day to remember what happened during the Holocaust and uh, to commemorate what happened. And this day actually is the 27th of January 1945 was the day that the Auschwitz concentration camp was liberated by the Soviet army. When they liberated this camp, so two days, 76 years ago, Otto Frank, the father of Anna, the only survivor of the eight people in hiding, was still there. He was still alive. So 76 years ago today, Otto Frank was liberated from Auschwitz. And he quote this little uh, sentence here, I was lucky and had good friends. So that's what he said. For him, it's a miracle that he survived the Holocaust, but he did. So it's today a day to remember what happened. So by being present today, all of us, we are doing our duty of this Holocaust Remembrance Day by thinking about what happened, honoring the survivor, honoring the people who died on that day, remember what it means to us also today, even today in 2021. So thank you very much, all of you, for being here on this special day. Um, we can think maybe this has nothing to do with Canada. It, the war did not take place there. The Nazi never invade Canada. But it's interesting to see how many strong connections Canada has with this story. And I'm going to show you a picture with, I want to enumerate a couple of, of connections that Canada has with either the Anna Frank story or the story of the, the history of the, the Netherlands or the Second World War. So on the this picture, I'm sorry, I'm so bad in explaining right and left, but this picture, I, I hope you see my cursor uh, circling the picture. This is a picture of the Royal Dutch family. And this picture has been taking, taken in Ottawa in 1943. And this picture is on Anne's wall. So you, we were gonna discuss about that later, but Anna Frank put a lot of pictures on her wall to cheer her, her room up. And this picture is there. So she has a picture of Ottawa with the Royal Dutch family. And this make a big strong connection with Canada because uh, for people of you who are in Ottawa or nearby, you know that there's every year a toilet festival. And this is because the, the Dutch people are sending uh, still today tulips every year to Ottawa to thank the Canadian for uh, having this family, the royal family during the war to make sure that they survive while the Dutch were occupied by the Nazi. So this is already a big strong connection with Canada and the Netherlands. If you look at the other picture at the other corner, you will you might know that uh, the Canadian soldiers were among the allies that were liberating Europe. And if you ask a lot of Dutch people today in a lot of Dutch city who liberate you, a lot of people will tell you that's the Canadian. So more, almost 5,000 people, Canadian soldiers have, uh, have been buried here in, Italy, in the Netherlands. So there's three can sit a Canadian war cemetery throughout uh, can uh, the Netherlands. Um, and this is one of the pictures of one of them in Holton. And every 24 of December, students will go bring a candle to every grave. So they made the ultimate sacrifice to help the Dutch to be liberated from the Nazi occupation. On the picture under that, you see a beautiful monument. This monument is in Amsterdam, and it's a monument dedicated to the Canadians because they liberate the city of Amsterdam. So there's almost 400 monuments across the whole country that are dedicated to Canadian. So the strong connection between the liberation of the country and Canada is really strong. You also have on this corner, this picture is a picture of Westerbork. That's a transit camp where Anna Frank will go after being arrested. And this transit camp is in the Netherlands and they have been liberated on the 12th of April, 1945 by guess who? Yes, the Canadian. So this is also a really a strong connection between Canada and the story of Anna Frank. Um, we know that many survivors of the Holocaust will choose Canada for their home after the war. The Europe is too much memories, so a lot will go to Canada, which makes that Canada will have this history through their testimonies. This will be part of Canadian history as well. And one of these person choosing Canada to live after the war is this person in the picture in the middle with, and I, I lost my cursor, but 
the middle one. Yeah, here we go. With the book, thank you, Canada. This is Victor Kugler. And Victor Kugler is one of the six helpers that help the Frank to uh, the family Frank and the other people in hiding to hide. So he will choose Canada after to go live after the war with his second wife, which we see on this picture. So they live in, in Toronto and he will die in 1991. So in Canada, he will continue to tell his story. So you see that we have a lot of connection between Canada and the Netherlands. And now let's hear Morgan tell us a little bit more about Anna Frank. Hi everyone, my name is Morgan Bailey. I'm based in the US in South Carolina. And I have the privilege of working for a partnership between the University of South Carolina and the Anne Frank House and the Anne Frank Center. And during normal circumstances, I get to travel throughout the US and if I'm lucky even farther and um, work on educational programs, working with students of all ages. Now, of course, we know right now, as Julie and Laura were mentioning, these types of in-person projects are not possible. And we know that nothing can replace those in-person interactions. But in the meantime, I'm very thankful to be able to connect with all of you in this way until we're able to be in person again. So like Julie mentioned, I'm going to give us a little bit of context about what we're gonna be diving into when we look at the hiding place. I'm sure all of you are coming to this webinar with different levels of knowledge about who Anne Frank is, why we talk about her, what is this story all about? And so I wanna give you a little bit of information about what happened before they went into hiding. Now, before I do that, let me just say, this is going to be the fastest overview ever. I'm definitely going to do it a disservice just because I don't have enough time. But I do want to encourage you after this to check out the Anne Frank House website. There is a very thorough timeline and all other kinds of resources there where you can fill in some of those gaps that you may have um, brought with you today. So we'll start here in this picture. It's called Merveda Plain. And this is where Anne Frank and her family lived before they went into hiding. This is in Amsterdam. Now there's a common misconception that Anne Frank and her family hid in the attic above their house where they were living, right? And this misconception comes from a common mistranslation, right? Sometimes we see um, it written that Anne Frank hid in an attic. And sometimes when we think of an attic, at least for me, and this is probably regional, we think of that space, that storage space, above a house, right? And so some people think that's the kind of environment that Anne Frank was in hiding in. Well, actually she did not hide in this space where her and her family were living. We're gonna take a look at where she was hiding, of course, but this is an image of where they lived before in the city. And in this neighborhood, um, Anne was just a normal girl. She had neighbors who were Jewish and non-Jewish. She had friends of all kinds, she loved playing in the big grassy area that you can see here. And she truly was just a normal girl. As we can see even further in this next photo of Anne and her sister on the left here at the beach. Again, she was just a normal girl. This picture was taken when she was around 12 or 13 years old. Her sister was a few years older than her. And her parents tried very hard to give them a normal life even though things around them were unfortunately becoming not so normal, as you can see shown on the photo on the right. Anne's parents were Edith and Otto, and they tried for a really long time to shield their girls from what was happening in the world around them. You see, they had actually moved from the Netherlands when Anne was just a toddler, or excuse me, moved from Germany to the Netherlands. Um, the same year that a man named Adolf Hitler was rising to power in Germany. They moved hoping to escape um, what they were afraid was going to be a very negative situation in Germany. The Netherlands had been uh, neutral during World War I, so they thought this will be the perfect place for us to go. But unfortunately, um, 
a lot of the really terrible things that were happening in Germany eventually followed them to the Netherlands. There were anti-Jewish laws being passed about when Jews were able to go shopping, uh, where they could shop, and eventually when they could even um, leave their homes. Laws that affected one part of the population, but of course not the other. And so they decided that they needed to start coming up with a plan of what they would do if the worst happened and they needed to go into hiding. And if, unfortunately, that day came when Margot and sister received in the mail what is known as a call up. And this call up basically said, Margot, pack your bags, be at the train station at this date, this time, and you're going to Germany to a work camp. And her parents said, absolutely not. There is no way that we are going to send our precious daughter alone to a different country to a work camp. Are you kidding me? So they said that's not going to happen. So what they decided to do was go into hiding. And on the next slide, we can see that they were not alone. There was the Frank family, the Van Pels family, and then a family friend named Fritz Pfeffer who went into hiding with them. Now, this was not as quick of a decision as I made it out to seem. It had been in the works. It was being planned for a very long time. We're gonna talk more about these people once we get into the hiding place, but here you get a quick little introduction to them. And then I will show you on the next slide, a quick introduction to very important people in this story, the helpers. Julie already mentioned them. There's no way that someone could be in hiding in one space, not leaving for over two years without dear friends or family or someone to help them, providing them with everything they were going to need during that time. And these are the people who did that for them. Now let's zoom in a little bit and take a look at physically where they went into hiding. So they went from Mermbeta Plain that we saw in the beginning to the building where Otto Frank worked. He owned a business here and we can see this building uh, highlighted in blue. Now I like this picture for a few reasons. One, I just think Amsterdam is absolutely beautiful. But two, I think that this photo gives us a really good understanding of why it was even possible for eight people to be in hiding in the middle of a city for two years. A lot of people hear this and they think, how is that even possible? How can someone be in a two-story hiding place in the middle of a city? That's not even hiding, right? But what we see here is that based on the architecture of Amsterdam, it really was possible. So you can see that the buildings are all touching each other, right? So compared to, for example, my house, if you came to my house, it's a freestanding building. And when you walked up to it, you'd be able to kind of see how big the house is, how far back it goes. And when you walk in, you could have some depth perception, right? About how deep this house goes. So if you only walked into the first room and I said, oh, that's it, that this is, this is the whole house, you'd be like, well, it seemed bigger from the outside, right? But as you can see here, if you're walking up to a house that is touching others on both sides, you have no idea how deep that house goes. So when you walk in, you have no reason to question that this is just the end. I've come to the end of it and there's nothing behind this last wall. So this next photo that we're gonna look at gives us one last glimpse at what this looks, looks like zoomed in. So you can see here the annex, not the attic, the annex is this extra little building that's built onto the back. And you see here in the middle, there is this bookcase and you've probably all heard of the bookcase and we're gonna take a look at that in just a second. But again, if you don't know how deep this building goes, then when you walk up to this bookcase and if you're told this is it, you have no reason to question that. Now this image I think is also important because you look at the bottom, when you look at the bottom two floors, you can see that those go all the way to the back. So this helps us understand why it was so important for the people in hiding to be so quiet because there were people underneath them working in this warehouse who had no idea that anyone was in hiding above them. So with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Julie, who is going to take us 
to the bookcase. Great, thank you very much. It was well done. Now let's go to the place. So here we are where uh, Morgan just told you. Hey Julie, I think you're gonna have to reshare since we're switching applications. So stop sharing and then reshare of the, um, the VR tour. Is not working, no? I still see the PowerPoint. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and reshare. Thank you very much for that. And now, are we? Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Morgan. So here we are. This is almost, we are almost into the annex now. This is exactly, we are in front of the bookcase, the famous bookcase that hide the entrance of the hiding place. You see in this room that there's one door here. This door leads to the front part of the house. This door was always closed and locked. The only person who had the keys to this door was Victor Kugro, one of the helper, remember? So that was a protection. So people who were coming were coming until that door. So they were not expecting, like Morgan said, other rooms. But still, the people in hiding were so afraid that they did had another protection, which is this bookcase. And this bookcase is hiding the entrance of the hiding place. This bookcase was built in 1942, exactly for the purpose of hiding this place where there were no door. So if you come to the Anna Frank house today, not today because we are closed, but when we are gonna go, be open again, uh, you will enter through this. This door is of course now open. You all will even don't see that door. And then you walk all the way here. And of course the bookcase will be slightly open to let you in. You see here below, there's a staircase. And this is a really important staircase because that was the helper staircase. So the helpers were working one floor below this and they used this staircase to come here to help, to go into the hiding place and supply the people in hiding with all different kinds of things. We're gonna talk about that later. So when you come here now that the Yana Frank has, you see the bookcase, one of the almost all only original pieces in our museum. It's still the one from 1942. It's protected with a glass, but it's still the original one. And we are really happy and are proud of that to show this one. Now, if you were in the Yana Frank house coming in, I will say to you, I will welcome you and I will say, when you go through this bookcase, look carefully, be careful first of your head because you will see there's a little step and Anna Frank write about it. They bump their head constantly about it until the time that they put a little cushion on it to make sure that they are not bumping their head anymore. But I will say also to you, look behind. When you go past this bookcase, if you turn back, you'll see at the back of the bookcase that there's a handle. And that showed that the people in hiding could close the bookcase or close the door from within. So it showed that it's, on, it's not only a bookcase, but it's really using it as, as a door. So be careful to your head. Morgan is bringing you now into the hiding place. Okay, so this is what we see when we walk through the bookcase. We've made sure we didn't bump our heads, like Julie said. This is the door that we just came through. And what we're about to do now is take a walk through the first floor of the hiding place. So we're gonna go through this door. We're gonna make a loop. We're gonna come out of this door and then we're gonna go up these stairs. So here is the first room, formal room of the hiding place. Now I wanna point out something to you first, and that is that, yes, we are not in Amsterdam today, which <laughs> I wish we could all be, but this is actually a really special and unique view that you couldn't even get in Amsterdam because the hiding place is currently empty of all furniture. So what we're seeing here is actually a really rare view. Sometimes people come in and they look at it and they think, wow, this is so big, it's so spacious, they had so much room and we have to remind them, well, remember it had a bunch of furniture. So it actually wasn't this big open space that you're seeing here. 
Now, the reason that this is all completely empty now goes back to Otto Frank. Remember, this is Anne's dad, and he was the only person who was in hiding here who survived. After the arrest, all of the furniture in this place was stolen. Uh, Jews were not considered to um, have any sort of property rights at the time. So it was technically illegal for them to have been hiding here. So once they were arrested and taken away, um, the, the furniture was all taken away because it wasn't respected as the rights of um, any of the Jewish people. So after the war, when Otto comes back to this place, he walks in and he finds it totally empty. And you can imagine how heavy this moment was for him, right? And so when it came time to open this space as a museum, he said that he wanted it to always stay empty, almost as a type of memorial to what had happened here. See, he recognized that Amsterdam and the Netherlands and Europe and the world, they, it was all gonna move on in one way or another from this moment in time. But he wanted there to be at least one place in the city of Amsterdam where things were just kind of frozen so that when young people walk through this space or anyone walk through this space um, years and years and years, 76 years into the future, they would find it exactly how he did. Now, something that I like to think about in this room when we see some little objects like this is just a reminder to me that every single one of these little things that we see here must have meant something really special to the people in hiding here. Imagine if you were told you're gonna to go into hiding and you don't have the ability to move a lot of things. You can only take a few items. You're gonna pick things that are really, really important to you. So I know that every single one of these things that we see is very valuable. And an example of this are the prayer books of Edith Frank. Now Edith, Anne's mom, was a religious person. And as can happen sometimes in families, sometimes, uh, some people may be more religious than others. Edith was religious, and she went to synagogue every week. She said her prayers regularly, and Margot often participated in this with her, whereas Anne and her dad weren't quite as observant. They would go to synagogue on um, special holidays. They would celebrate the holidays, but it wasn't as important for them to go weekly. But Edith wanted to bring her prayer books because, again, this was something that was really, really special to her. Now, I want to show you here, I want to point out to you that in this room, it wasn't just Otto and Edith. You can see here in the bottom left-hand corner, it's also listed as Margot Frank's room. Now, in the beginning, when they were planning out this hiding place, the idea was that the mom and dad would share this bedroom and that Anne and her sister Margaret would share the next bedroom. Now, what ended up happening was they brought an extra person into hiding with them a few months after they had already moved in. And that was Fritz Pfeffer, the dentist. Now, this wasn't a part of the original plan, and so they had to adjust. And part of that adjustment was that Margaret would move into this room with her parents, and Anne would share the room next door with Fritz. Now, before we move on, I wanna show you two things quickly that are actually still in the museum when you go and are what I would consider to be the most moving, most powerful in the whole space, in my opinion. This is a map that tracked the advancement of the Allied forces at Normandy. Otto Frank would listen to the radio and he would listen to all of the updates and he would put pins to note where the troops were in hopes that, of course, they were going to um, get to Amsterdam, liberate the city, and then everyone in hiding would get to go free. Now, eventually, we know that that did happen, like Julie mentioned, but unfortunately, it did not happen in time for the Frank family. But what to me is the most moving point in this space is this. Still on the wall today, you can see in the hiding place where Anne and Margot's parents tracked the growth of their girls over the two years while they were in hiding. Anne grew a lot. She grew about 13 centimeters. Margot, just a few, because Margot was a few years older, so she had already hit that growth spurt. 
But I think this is just so moving to me because it's easy for us to think, what do I have in common with a Jewish girl from the Netherlands? I, I can't really connect to her. I don't have much in common with her. But when I see something like this, it's a reminder. My parents did the same thing for me when I was growing up. I remember them tracking my height. And this is just something I think we can all relate to when we think about us growing up. But it's just a reminder of how much Anne and her sister were loved dearly by their parents. So I'm going to pass it over to Julie, who's going to take us into the next bedroom. Thank you, Morgan. Time is flying. It's incredible. We are already only 10 minutes. So we are now in Anne's room, Anne's and Fritz Pfeffer room. So we came here through this door here next is and uh, Edith Otto and Margot's room. So you can see, like I told you before, that Anna Frank put a lot of images to cheer up her room, as you can see. You can see also there are two beds here for Anne and for Fritz. And I wanted to show you the picture that I showed you earlier from the du Royal Dutch family in, uh, in um, Ottawa. It's here on this on the wall right here. And if you come to the museum today, you will see also all those pictures. They have been preserved. And so that's why we can see them still. I forget to mention that what you are all seeing, all the furniture, it's computerized images. They are not picture of the real thing. We don't have anything like Morgan said, they took everything. So we have no real uh, object. So it's already com computerized images by witnesses, how they told us how it's looked like. But the growth of um, the picture, the diary, the hiding, the bookcase, of course, are all from original one. No, so here we are in Anne and Fritz's room. There's three things I want to quickly show, say. So the pictures, if you just study the picture, it's incredible how you can learn better Anna Frank because she will grow during these two years in hiding. So in the beginning, she's just putting some stars of Hollywood stars on the picture on the wall and the royal families, which she loved. And then as time goes, she starts to put picture above the other one because she's getting more mature and she thinks, oh, this is childish. Now I'm thinking about philosopher of I, I want to show the nature. So just through those images, you see how she evolved in these two years. Another thing interesting in this room is to talk, of course, of the diary of Anna Frank that you can see here on her desk. It's everything for her. It's her friend. With a, she don't see her real friend anymore. So it's the only way she can express herself. And she's doing it totally openly. And she's really not self-censoring. She's saying everything what she thinks. And she had a lot of time to write, of course. So she's almost every day writing in her diary, all what she, she feels, the frustration, the tension, the love, uh, the, the fear, everything she's putting in her diary. It's her friend. It's the only way she can cope with the whole situation. You know, uh, she will hear on the radio that they want to publish every diary that has been written during the war. So she hears that and she thinks right away, maybe I can, they can publish my diary. So she will decide to rewrote the whole diary in the highly of publishing it. So she's still continuing to add entry almost daily, but she rewrote the whole thing using other names for uh, publication later. So of course she has a lot of time to read. So that's that to write and she loved to do that so that's uh, what's making possible Thir third thing i want to show to tell here is the tension between Anne and fritz Anne is 13 to 15 years old during the hiding time fritz is 54 to 56 so according to her it's a old man severe strict saying everything what he's doing she's doing wrong to her mother so she has problem living with him and the big thing is that they are fighting constantly about this little disc here because she wants to use it to write in a diary and he wants to do to use it to do real work because he found all this diary writing a childish thing to do and he said I need it because I need to do real work so she has to fight to use this this little disc to be able to write a diary 
it's difficult for her to live with that like this. It was difficult for him also. He's the only one who is alone. The other two are families. They are complete. He's alone. He has a wife somewhere in Amsterdam. She's not hiding because she's Catholic, so she's not persecuted. Uh, and he has a son in, the, in, New, in, in England. So he's the only one not with his family, and he has to share a room with a teenager, which I think she was not always that easy to live with. So for both of us, it was really high, difficult to live in such a little place with the two of them. So that was Anne's room and Fritz's room. Now let's go to the next room with Morgan. Okay, so on to a room that is often not considered important, but I think we would all say is very important, the bathroom. Now, I pointed out to you in a picture in the beginning, I can show you that same image here, that there were people underneath the hiding place who had no idea someone was in hiding, so they had to be very, very quiet. Now, the bathroom is here, and you can see the pipe behind the toilet here. And anytime they would use the bathroom, water would go down that pipe and straight through the warehouse where all those people were working. And so this is why they were not able to use the bathroom um, during certain hours of the day, not run water, um, not cook anything. Uh, they really had to schedule out their time to make sure they were being as quiet as possible during uh, the working day. Now, this room reminds me of something very, very important. Anne was able to do something that I think even a lot of adults have a hard time with, and that is to hold to seemingly contradictory realities as true at the same time. So what does that mean? Anne recognized that being in hiding was so incredibly difficult. They could not leave this space. They were fighting. The food was not always very good. She missed her friends. She missed her life. Her whole life was basically stolen from her during this time. But she also recognized that she was so incredibly fortunate to have this hiding place and to be with her family. Because so many people who went into hiding had to separate from their families, especially children. So she knew she was fortunate to be with her family, but she also knew she was in a very difficult position. And so even though they couldn't use the bathroom whenever they wanted and knew she was very fortunate that she even had a bathroom and had running water and had the ability to have privacy because in so many other stories of people going into hiding, they might be in the woods or in a barn somewhere hiding behind stacks of hay and they didn't have access to these things. So Anne was very, very thankful for what she did have here, even though she knew it was incredibly challenging. And I think in some ways we can all relate to that right now, living through the time of the coronavirus. We know that what any of us are experiencing right now can never be compared to what it would be like to go into hiding from the Nazis fearing for your life. It's in no way equivocal. But I think we can also recognize that maybe we're having to hold some seemingly opposite realities as true at the same time right now, right? That, you know, life is tough right now for so many people, for so many reasons, virtual learning and not being able to get out. People are losing their jobs. Things are hard right now. But at the same time, we do have a lot to be thankful for. And so I think we can look to Anne as an example of how to get through some of the tougher times that we may go through. So I'm going to pass it back over to Julie now, who is going to take us to the upstairs of the hiding place. Yeah, I'm sorry, I forget that I had to go on the... Sorry, so I... Uh... I'll go back here. So we're going to go through this door. Remember when we stop, when we start, Morgan still lost this stair. Now we take this big steep stairs to go on the second floor of the hiding place. And this is the Van Pels room. So this is the room of the second couple. 
that were sleeping here. As you can see, it's the biggest room of the whole hiding place. So it was also the place where the age people were coming during the day. So they are two floor up. So it's making more distance between the working people in the warehouse on the ground floor and the people in hiding. You see there's a big table with eight chairs, so all the eight people in hiding were coming here to have the meals to play during the day, during the working time of the warehouse worker. They were playing some games, reading, writing. They were all there together making as less sounds as possible to not be uh, discovered. Uh, and then on the night it was the sleeping place or the uh, room, sleeping room for Hermann and August von Pels. You remember, you saw it, uh, you see, saw their picture in the beginning. This is the other couple that are friends with the Frank and they, when the Frank thought about going there into hiding, they think this is big enough, we can ask another family. So that's why the Van Pels, who Hermann, Hermann von Pels was working with Otto Frank, they know each other. The Van Pels are also Jews, are also from Germany originally. And so they move a couple of days later in the frame, in the hiding time, in the hiding place. Sorry. So here they were coming during the day. And this room, I want to talk about the helpers because this in this room, the helpers were coming. Remember, they were using this helper stairs coming through the hiding place, uh, the bookcase, and they were going right up the stairs and coming here. And they were also most having their lunch every time here. During that time, the lunch was taken back home. So they had one and a half hours to go back to lunch. So the worker in the warehouse were going home and the people of the helpers who were working in the office were coming to help to lunch with the people in hiding. And Anna Frank loved that. It was breaking the routine. It was bringing someone else into the hiding place. She could listen to Beth or Meep, the, the helpers talk about what they've done. Have they been to the cinema? Did they take a walk so they, she could smell the, the coat and she could smell outside through their coming. So it's it was a nice time for Anna. And the helpers are so important. They were essential for these eight people in hiding. You, mem you mentioned you can never go outside. So how did you get food now? This was what the helpers had to do. Bring them food, bring them medicine. And we know Morgan tell us that Anna Frank is growing, so she needs new clothes. Um, if they get sick, of course, they cannot go to this hospital uh, or to see a doctor. So they had to bring their medicine. Everything has to be taken care of by the six helpers. So without the six helpers, our eight people in hiding will never have been able to last that long. So the helpers are every day helping the eight people in hiding. And uh, they were often coming here. So now let's go see the next room with Morgan. Okay, so this is the last formal room on the hiding place, and it belongs to Peter Van Pels, the son of the other couple that Julie mentioned, the friends of the Frank, um, of Otto and Edith Frank. Now, Peter, if you've read Anne's diary, you know that Anne had a very um, up and down relationship with Peter when he when she first uh, began living with him, they were all together. She describes him as dull and boring. She was not very interested in him. Now, to give Peter a little bit of credit, we know that Anne was incredibly outgoing, incredibly outspoken, had so much life and personality that I think maybe you can't blame someone for being considered dull by Anne, because I think maybe in comparison, everyone would have been dull. Um, but eventually they began spending more time together and she realized that actually he's not dull. He's just more shy than I am, which again, it's not hard to be more shy than Anna is, right? And as you could see from that little sneak peek, they eventually began having feelings for each other. They shared Anne's first kiss. And you can read in the diary about all of the feelings that Anne was developing for Peter and what an exciting time in her life it was. And again, it's such a good reminder that even though these circumstances are bizarre and they're terrible and it's a horrible situation, 
Anna's still a normal girl. And so she's still thankfully able to experience some of the normal parts of growing up. Now, eventually, Anne basically falls out of love with Peter and the feelings just start to go away. And like Julie mentioned, um, Anne began focusing on rewriting her diary and hoping that it would be published one day and really wanted to become a serious writer as she wanted to, as she described herself in her diary. And so she thought, Peter is distracting me. I have to focus. It's time for me to be a serious writer. And that is what she did. Um, I'll point out here, Peter's bike was so important to him. Uh, he even brought it into hiding with him. Now, I'm going to say when you all go to Amsterdam, because I believe it's going to happen, you will learn that bikes are so incredibly important, more important than I could have even wrapped my mind around before I went for the first time. There are way more bikes than people. There are basically parking garages for bicycles. I don't know. Julie maybe may know how many bikes are in the city, but it is got to be a ridiculous number. And so you can see here, Peter's bike was very important to him because he brought it, wrapped it in some paper to keep it safe and then kept it here for safekeeping. So like I said, this is the last formal room of the hiding place, but Julie is gonna show us one last little spot that's very, very special to Anne before we move on to questions. Okay, thank you again. So I know that we want to have time for questions, so I'm going to be really quick. This is the attic. This is the, the only place where nobody was sleeping. Uh, and the big reason was because there were rats. So luckily, Peter brought his cat, so he took care of a part of the rats problem, but still, they were still, so that's why they were not using it to as a bedroom, they were using it as a storage room. If you go to the Anna Frank house, it's not a, a, able to see this room anymore, unfortunately, but we have some mirror that show a little bit how it is, but you cannot go there. So you have an extra here because when you go to the Anna Frank house, this place is not open for public. Um, so this place is especially where Anna Frank could see through this window. There were one window that was not covered. All the other was covered so that nobody can see them, but this one was not covered. And through that window, Anne could see a tree. And through that tree, she could follow the season. She was really enjoying coming here with Peter when she's in love, alone when she's not anymore, and then this, see the nature. So she, through this window, she could see a bird flying there, the sky, the tree with the uh, tree uh, with the leaves or not so she it was really important for her she was really enjoying the nature more and more and I want to finish because I think at the Anna Frank house we never used the diary enough so I want to finish with a quote I'm gonna be really quick it's a quote that's fitting with this uh, place where we are here now so it's written on the Friday 14th of April 1944 and sorry for my English I'm occasionally sentimental, as you know, but from time to time, I have reason to be. When Peter and I are sitting close together on a hard wooden crate among the junk and dust, our arms around each other's shoulders, Peter toying with the lock of my hair, when the birds outside are trilling their songs, when the trees are in bud, when the sun becomes and the sky is so blue, oh, that's when I wish for so much. All I see around me are dissatisfied and grumpy faces. All I hear are sighs and stifled complaints. You'd think our lives had taken a sudden turn for the worst. Honestly, things are only as bad as you make them. Here in the annex, no one ever bothers to set a good example. Everyone has to decide for himself how to get the better of his own mood. Every day you hear, if only it were all over. Work love, courage, and hope make me good and help me cope. So I want you to take the own conclusion to this quote, but I think it was showing a little bit of the, this way of coping for Anna Frank, and I think it's a great uh, way to end this uh, virtual tour. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I hope you have appreciated, and I hope I will be able to welcome you, all of you, ever here in the Amsterdam, in the real museum. And now let's go back to uh, the team in EF, so Laura and Vanessa, to, hi, to try to answer some of your questions. Oh, wow. 
Well, that was incredible. Thank you so much, Julie and Morgan. Uh, and the connections that you made to the circumstances that we find ourselves in today are so interesting and so valid. Uh, but I think it's time for some questions. So our first question comes to us from Bruce R. Vanessa, if you could unmute Bruce R so they can ask their question live. I would love to, but I can't find Bruce in here. So let's ask on his behalf. Oh, perfect. Okay. So the question that Bruce has is, can you describe how it feels to work in a place like the Anne Frank House and with groups? When you arrive in the morning, what do you think about what happened there? And do you think about it when you're not at work? Yeah, uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think it's really special place to work for. And I think we sometimes kind of forget. And this emotional part is putting aside and we do our work. And sometimes when we are uh, coming in, in relation with the visitors and we realize where for what for special place we work and what I love in this work is when we uh, welcome visitors at the Anna Frank House or when we work with a traveling exhibition everywhere in the world where we are traveling with it's the people sharing their own connection to it and it's beautiful to see that everyone has something to share that is connected to Anna Frank we always think that this is Jewish history from the, the Holland during the second world war time but it's not true everyone has a connection to it everything everyone can connect and identify to Anna Frank and then we are getting this amazing moment to with the visitors that they can share their experience with us so it's a really special moment it's a rewarding thing to have to do it daily and that put everything back into places that we are working for a really special place i hope it answered the question too. i think so yes all right our next live question is going to come from mackenzie f so vanessa if you could unmute mackenzie f so they can answer yep. ask the question she's unmuted and she should be able to or she should be able to unmute herself now mackie are you or mackenzie are you ready yes um my question well i, I think i have two questions but do you display um Anne's original diary in the museum Yes, we are. We are having the, the original diary is on display in our museum, as well as all the leaf, loose leaves that's where she wrote the diary. So it's on display in our museum. Another little note to that as well, great question, is that I think sometimes we think of Anne's diary as this nice, neat book, right? Because that's how we read it. But we forget sometimes that Anne filled up that first diary pretty quickly she wrote a lot right and so then she started writing in other notebooks and like Julie mentioned loose leaf, loose, loose leaf pages as well and so there's a whole display of of her writings yeah and um did Otto Frank when he was alive ever visit the museum yes he was a very big part of um but planning it and opening it, he was involved from the very beginning. Thanks. Thanks, Mackenzie. You're welcome. Wonderful. Okay, um, we've got a question here from Marlon K. Uh, Vanessa, would you be able to unmute Marlon K to ask their question? Let's see. Marlon, you should be okay to unmute yourself now. Hello. Hi, please go Hi. ahead with your question. Yeah, my original question was what was below the house in that warehouse or industry? Uh, just kind of trying to paint a picture of uh, what the daily community was like there, like how many people were around in and out, giving a sense of like how secretive you needed to be or that kind of, I guess. Yeah, thanks. I'm sorry, I did not, on the, it, was it about the Jewish community in Amsterdam? I, I, I was, I did not hear it good, sorry. Did you want me to ask, or? I think about the, the actual warehouse, right? The building, yeah. like what Hello. was happening in the building. Is that right? Below, like what kind of activity was going on there and just a general, like what was 
going on in the streets daily to give a sense of how many people they were hiding from or the extent to which they did not want to be visible. Uh, just that kind of sense of uh, secrecy that was around in the community, what they had to avoid. Sure. So uh, in the actual building itself, um, we had mentioned that Otto Frank, that was his business, right? So that was his, um, you know, where he went to work every day. And in that business, what they did is they created a product um, called Pectin. The company was called Opecta. And uh, basically they made uh, this product that was used in jams and jellies. Uh, today we go to the grocery store and we just buy the, the jelly we want. But back then they had to um, buy the like gelatin like substance and then they would use their own fruits to create their own jelly. So they made that product and spices as well. Um, and so the, the helpers that we talked about earlier, they all worked in the offices. So they basically ran the business. And so they knew that people were hiding, um, but all of the workers in the warehouse actually creating and packaging and doing all of that, they did not know. So when we think about how quiet they had to be um, and, and like what a sense of fear, I guess, what the, the feeling was like, um, it was pretty high because a lot of the people, most of the people who worked in the building did not know they were in hiding there. Um, and then I think you also mentioned what it was like outside on the streets as well. Um, and there was there was a lot of fear. Um, it, it also just, it, it wasn't a good time for anyone in, in Amsterdam, not just Jewish people. The winters were incredibly harsh and food was difficult to come by even um, for someone who wasn't in hiding. So it was a very um, anxiety ridden time. There was a lot of, um, of theft, a lot of robbery going on because so many people were very poor. So I hope that kind of addresses your question. And if I can add one thing is that it was uh, a, so a kind of a, a, there were a lot of people chasing Jewish people hiding. So you had to be sure that they were just doing that because you couldn't get money if you were betraying Jewish people. Um, so it, 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 there was one thing above this all. So that's why they had to, to shut all the, the window to make sure that no neighborhood neighbors can see them walking because we never know who was uh, could betray you and, and have this, 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 this rewarding for doing that. So it was like Morgan said, constantly this, this insecurity, this scary of being uh, discovered by someone that, you, that might would say it to the Nazi, so. Thanks, Marlon. No problem. Okay, I know we don't have much time left for questions, um, but I, I, I would love to ask um, on behalf of quite a few people who've asked a similar question, which is that they wanted to know, what do we know about how the Frank family was betrayed or found out? and what may have happened to them afterwards, or if we know, or if we don't know. I guess I can start, Julie, and you can take over. <laughs> There's so much to this question, but the, the quick answer is we don't know. And I'm so glad this was asked because out of curiosity this morning, I actually Googled this just to see what would come up. And you know how uh, Google gives you questions and a drop-down box with answers already written out? And it actually listed the name of a person. And I thought, this is such a good reminder that we can't believe everything we read on the internet because if you just Google this and look at the first answer that comes up, it may not be right. Um, so thank you for asking this question. Um, there are so many theories about what, how they were arrested. And at the end of the day, the quick answer is we just don't know. There is always someone looking into this question. Um, even today, I know there are people who are still trying to find out. And of course, we have new technologies and everything that maybe could help find this out. But at the end of the day, we simply don't know. It could have been uh, a warehouse worker below. It could have been um, someone who is suspicious of the helpers. Um, there are a lot of theories, but we don't know. Julie, what would you say to that? 
I, I want to, you're totally right. We don't know, and it's still a big mystery in this, uh, is this whole story. What I want to add is we so much not know that we are even doubting if there were really a betrayal. So we are that far in the research that we think maybe they have not been betrayed. If we try to find who betrayed them for more than 70 years and never found out, we start now to do other research. So have they really been betrayed or have they been found out by bad luck because the Nazi were searching for something else like a black market product. So that's where our, some of our colleagues are working on. So was there really betrayal? So it's it, that's it. There's something missing part in the story that we, we still don't know what happened. And there's a FBI agent uh, retired that is doing a research now. So maybe he will find out the truth. But so far, we are still don't know what is exactly happened. Oh, well, a great tour and really great questions. Thank you, everyone. Uh, that's all the time that we have for today. But before we go, I do want to just sneak in one last little question for Julie and Morgan. What advice would you give to the students and the teachers watching today who are hoping to visit the Anne Frank House Museum someday soon? The, the logistical advice will be uh, to book a ticket online, even not Corona time, it's the, it was the way to do that now. So, and book an early time, because they're the earlier, so when we open right away this time, so then when you come inside the, the house is empty and it's getting you really better experience than with all these crowded people. That's Luckily EF advice. can take care of those logistics if you are <laughs> traveling with us one day to Amsterdam. But is there anything else that you would share any advice to how to prepare yourself before visiting either Julie or Morgan? I would say to give yourself time to really reflect before and after you go. Um, I wouldn't suggest, um, you know, scheduling yourself so that you have to do something else and then you go to the Anne Frank house and then you leave and do something different. I think um, this is the kind of experience you'd want to give yourself time to really reflect on after. And then um, when you go home, look at ways you can get involved in local programming. Like Julie said, she coordinates all the projects in Canada. And so you don't have to be in Amsterdam to be connected to the work. Of course, we want you to go, but when you come back, I'd say get a hold of Julie and um, figure out how you can be involved. Even and if in you Canada. want a total experience, read a diary before going, then you get really <laughs> more information. Of about course. Where you are. <laughs> Number one suggestion. <laughs> Number one. Well, if you want to learn more about how EF can help you get there, look out for an email from us tomorrow. We'll share a link to the recording of today's session, as well as some other helpful links to help you learn more. And of course, you can always visit our website at any time. And if you have a moment, please do share your feedback about today's session with us by filling out the survey you'll see when you exit. Thank you again to Julie and Morgan and the Anne Frank House Museum and to all of you for participating today. We hope to see you again soon. Bye for now. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. again don't know where don't know when but i know we'll meet again some sunny day keep smiling through just like you always do Till the blue skies drive the dark clouds far away. So will you please say hello to the folks that I know. Tell them I won't be long. They'll be happy to know that as you saw me go, I was singing. Song. We meet again, don't know where, don't know what.